Okay, today we're going to discuss all about the thrombotic disorders and the management and even the different laboratory tests that will help us then to diagnose someone to have the thrombosis. So when we speak about the thrombosis, it's just the inappropriate formation of your fibrin clot, unregulated or uncontrolled, that would result here to your thrombus formation. Okay, and basically that one would have your abnormality in your blood vessel wall or even abnormality in the overactivation of your coagulation factors, our platelet functions, and also defective na uh, fibrinolysis system. Okay, and the uh, thrombosis here, the cleft formation, would eventually result to your ischemia. That would result here to your decreased blood flow. Kasi may clot na nakabara. It could also result here to your tissue damage, or you call it one as your tissue necrosis. Okay, then we have here the term uh, thrombophilia or your hypercoagulopathy, still a type of your um, thrombosis. So we have here several factors that would eventually try to result to our thrombosis. So it could be caused here by our physical, chemical, biological conditions that releases here the different pro, uh, pro-thrombotic mediators responsible for the clotting process or thrombosis. Another one is inappropriate activation of your coagulation factors, inappropriate activation of your platelets or even your blood vessels and your fibrinolysis system. So, hindi mo madigest ang clot, that's a problem with your fibrinolysis. And that's results here to your, still the presence of the clot because it is not digest. We can classify our thrombosis as either venous thrombosis, so that would eventually be found within our uh, vein. So, example for that, we have here your deep vein thrombosis. Your deep vein thrombosis is characterized by the presence of the clot in your iliac, popliteal, femoral veins, and calves of the upper legs. Your large thrombi is eventually characterized by the presence of large clot formed in the veins of the upper extremities, including your intestine, your brain, and your kidney. And we have also here your... <coughs> Pulmonary emboli, so that's your clot here try to ascend, going to your pulmonary tract. Okay, another type of thrombosis, we have your arterial thrombosis. So basically, this one is characterized by the clot formation found within our arteries. Example for that, we have your cardiovascular accident, CVA. You can also have here your AMI, acute myocardial infarction, your stroke. We have also your PAO, peripheral arterial occlusion, and we have also here your transient ischemic attack. Um, the most common one is your PAO, peripheral arterial occlusion, and transient ischemic attack, but they, they are less fatal compared with your cardiovascular disease and stroke. So in the arterial thrombosis, primarily made up of this being caused here by the production of your arteriosclerotic plaque or my plaque na nakabara. And your arteriosclerotic plaque is actually made up of your activated mga cells, including your platelets, monocyte, macrophages, which are embedded in our fats or lipids, which eventually try to suppress the release of your nitric oxide para mag-facilitate ng, um, to prevent here your thrombosis, because your nitric oxide try to be responsible here for the vasodilation of your blood vessel. But at the same time, this one also try to activate here the release of your tissue factor because tissue factor is needed para mag-combine ng ating factor 7 para magkakaroon ng clot formation. And with that, that also results here to your clot formation. Okay, then we have here the different risk factor associated with our thrombosis. Number one, we have here the acquired. Acquired here is something that is environmental factors. The first one, we have your age. So... At the age of more than 50 years old, the patient would put that one to higher risk of uh, acquiring or having that thrombosis. Immobilization, so pag hindi gumagalaw ang patient natin, like distance driving, like your um, distance travel, we have also bedridden, mga ganon. So most likely, uh, they have the tendency to develop here stroke. Kaya nga, di ba, galaw-galaw para hindi ma-stroke, parang ganon. Another acquired factor here, we have your lipid metabolism. So higher chance of developing thrombosis here if you high your if you have high level of your total cholesterol, your LDL, your bad cholesterol, 
your low density lipoprotein which is your bad cholesterol, even your lipoprotein A. And at the same time, decrease ang ating good cholesterol, decrease value ng ating HDL cholesterol. Another one, acquired factor, we have your oral contraceptives with your progesterone, which eventually try to increase here, there is a four to six times if you are on the progesterone therapy. Pregnancy also try to increase the risk of the thrombosis. Hormonal replacement therapy will try to increase the risk here by two, uh, by three to five times. And we have also here smoking would also have increased the risk of your stroke here or arterial thrombosis by two to four times. Another factor that try to be responsible here for the development of the thrombosis would be related to your systemic disorders. So if you have existing the mass systemic disorder, then eventually that might be the reason why you develop your thrombosis. The first one, we have your SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, where the patient tried to develop your antiphospholipid antibody. And that antiphospholipid antibody is directed towards, uh, directed towards your phospholipid component of your different tissues in your body, and that results to your thrombosis. Example of your antiphospholipid antibody, we have your anti-cardiolipin, and we have, one to, we have also your anti-GPI antibody. So these are prothrombotic. Another one, malignant steroid cancer. Example for that, we have your migratory thromboflebitis or your Trosho syndrome. That is considered to be an occult cancer of your pancreas and your colon. And in the presence of your malignancy, that would eventually try to produce your tissue factor analog. And remember, the tissue factor is one of your substance that try to facilitate the clotting process. So once tissue factor is exposed, it will bind with your tissue, with your factor 7, and it will eventually try to result here to the clotting process or thrombosis. And we have your other, system, other systemic disorder that would result here to your thrombosis. We have here your myeloproliferative syndrome, like in the case of your essential thrombos thrombocytemia and polycythemia vera, that would result here to your overactivation of the platelets. So if you have your overactivation of the platelets, it would result here to your thrombosis. So brang dami ang platelets natin, overactivated in clot formation, the thrombosis. Then we have your leukemia. We have your acute promyelocytic leukemia, acute myelogenous leukemia would have increased risk for your DIC. Remember that your DIC would always have a thrombotic, thrombotic tendency. PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, is characterized by mutation that would try to modify the platelet membrane receptor that would eventually result here to the overactivation of platelets. Then again, pag nag-overactivate ang platelet natin, that would also result to your clot formation. Then we have your chronic inflammatory conditions, like for example, your diabetes, um, cancer, infection, autoimmune disorders, of also here your obesity and smoking, that would eventually try to increase. Nagkakaroon ng thrombotic tendency because what you have is increased fibrinogen and increased your factor 8. Fibrinogen is a substrate for the clotting process and factor 8, once it's not uh, digest or inhibited, it will just result to your clotting process. At the same time, in your chronic inflammatory conditions or chronic inflammation, what you have here would be the decreased production of your free na protein S. Pag uh, wala kang free protein S, free protein S, walang magbabind sa ating uh, protein C to form your ABC protein S complex. So, walang magdadigest ng coagulation factors natin. Specifically, for factor 5, factor 8, and therefore just lead to your clotting process. Another risk factor, we have here your congenital okay, factors. The first one, we have your antithrombin deficiency. Bakit nagkakaroon ng thrombosis pag wala kang antithrombin? Remember that our thrombin converts your fibrinogen to your fibrin clot. So pag wala mag-inhibit ng thrombin by the action of your antithrombin, ang fibrinogen natin will just be converted to your clot. So pag wala kang antithrombin, Walang mag-inhibit ng thrombin. So, the thrombin, we're going to do with that is just keep on converting, digesting your fibrinogen to your fibrin clot. And that results to your uh, thrombosis or clotting process. Okay, your antithrombin here, try to inhibit your factor 2, factor 9, 10, and 11. 
Another one, protein S, protein C deficiency. So remember that the action over A, B, C, protein S complex, tend to digest or factor 5 and factor 8. So pag wala kang A, B, C, protein S, because you have deficiency of that, walang magda-digest. Yung factor 5, factor 8, and eventually it will just keep on uh, clot formation lang. So thrombosis. Another one, we have your APC resistance. Other name for that one is your factor 5 latent mutation. So this is characterized here by mutation in the form of your R506Q, where in your Q, Q is your Q, uh, this your Q -tamine, glutamine. Glutamine is being replaced by your arginine, okay, in position number 506. Glutamine, I mean glutamine replaces your arginine at position number 506 and become here your substitute. It's a, a form of your mutation, a form of your substitution. Ano mangyayari pa nagkaroon ng substitution dito wherein your glutamine replaces your arginine at position 506. This would render your factor 5 to be resistant to your APC. And therefore, pag resistant siya sa APC, your factor 5 will not be digested. And therefore, ang mangyari, it will just keep on clotting lang. Kasi wala naman nag-inhibit sa kanya. So, that become thrombosis. Another one, we have your prothrombin G20-210A is another mutation. Where in your adenine replaces your glutamine. Uh, adenine replaces your glycine at position 2,210. That would result here to your untranslated na prothrombin. So, pag hindi na-translate ang prothrombin natin, dadami ang prothrombin natin, and therefore, madami kang thrombin. Pag madami kang thrombin, madami ang fibrinogen makoconvert to your fibrin clot. And this clot formation. Kaya thrombosis. Another one, hyperfibrinogenemia. So, sobrang dami ng fibrinogen. Remember, our fibrinogen is our substrate for clot formation. So, sobrang daming substrate, sobrang dami ng fibrinogen, so madami ka ding clot formation. And that's your thrombosis. Okay, then we have here the thrombophilia laboratory profile. These are actually normal values. So, pag ito ang result ng patient natin, based on the reference, then we consider patient to be normal, wala siyang thrombosis. Pero pag um, not within the normal reference range here, so that might predispose a patient here to develop your thrombosis. The first one, we have your APC, activated, activated protein C. So, our normal reference here should be more than 1.8, okay, as with respect to the APTT na result ng clotting time. So, paano natin malalaman na 1.8 siya? So, again, the APC, normally ang APC natin, how does 1 tend to digest your factor 5 and factor 8? So, pag naglagay tayo ng factor 5 and factor, pag naglagay tayo ng APC sa ating plasma dapat, it tend to digest your factor 5 and factor 8. And therefore, prolonged dapat, hindi tayo magkakaroon ng clotting process. So, like for example, the procedure for this one, ito. Patient plasma, nag-add ka ng calcium chloride, which is this one is an agent for your APTT. Then, you add your APC. Again, pa nag-add tayo ng APC, since your APC tend to digest your factor 5 and factor 8, dapat it will have a prolonged na APTT time result. Ito naman isa, as our control, so we have your patient plasma plus calcium chloride, wala kang ina-add na APC. And therefore, ang result nito ay hindi siya ganun ka-prolong. Iko-compare mo lang. Itong isa, naglagay ka ng APC. Itong isa, walang APC. Dapat ang result nito na naglagay ka ng APC. Ang result ng APTT niya should have here more than 1.8. Oh, sorry. More than 1.8 times na prolong compared with the, the one na wala kang APC. Ano ibig sabihin na like for example, hindi siya ganun ka-prolong ang result ni patient natin. So, kahit naglagay ka ng APC, bakit din siya na-prolong? Remember that your APC try to digest your factor 5 and factor 8. And with that, dapat na-prolong siya kasi walang nag-inhibit ng clot formation natin, di ba? Since, I mean, may nag-inhibit ng clot formation natin because you have your APC. So, therefore, hindi siya dapat nagka-clot kasi dinigest mo na ang mga factor 5, factor 8. So, like for example, hindi, ang ratio mo is not more than 1.8. Hindi siya ganun ka-prolong. Means even if you add your APC, would, that what it would signify here that the patient would have an APC resistant. Pag APC resistant, 
So, ang result mo dapat dito is less than 1.8. Another one, we have factor 5, latent mutation. So, wild type is the reference. Prothrombin G2020 tends wild type then. Lupus anticoagulant profile. So, normally, dapat wala tayong lupus anticoagulant because in the presence of the lupus anticoagulant, in a patient with the SLE, that would eventually put the patient at risk for the thrombosis. So, normally, negative siya. That will mean here na ang patient natin ay walang thrombosis. So, pag nag-positive ito, that become thrombosis. Anti-cardiolipin antibody. This is an antibody. So, ang normal reference natin for distance antibody siya, IG, so saka IgM antibody. That's what we are measuring here. For the IgG antibody, IgG antibody ng anti-cardiolipin antibody natin, the normal reference for that is less than 12. For IgM, the normal reference is less than 10. So, pag ang result mo dito ay more than 12, more than 10, that's thrombosis. My thrombus formation ang patient natin. Another one, we have your anti beta 2 GPI antibodies. So, ang ating reference for both your IgG and IgM na unit is less than 20. If the result of the patient here is more than 20 unit, then that will signify that the patient would have a thrombosis. Another one, we have your antithrombin activity. The normal values natin ay 78 to 126 percent. So, pag may thrombosis ang patient natin ay mababa ang result nito. Pag less than 78 ang result ng antithrombin activity ng patient natin, so that will diagnose, that would mean here the patient would have a thrombosis. Then we have your PC activity, that's 70 to 140 percent. So pag wala kang PC, walang magda-digest. Okay, so that will eventually result to your clotting process, thrombosis. So pag ang result mo dito ay less than 70, okay, that become thrombosis. Okay, the P... Okay, for the PS activity, the normal value is 65 to 140 percent. Pag mababa sa 65%, less than 65%, that will signify the patient would have thrombosis. Kasi tumutulong mga ito para mag-digest ng clot natin. Okay, so therefore, pag wala sila, hindi mawala. Ano ba? It, it, I mean, tumutulong sila mag-digest ng ating clotting coagulation factors. So pag wala sila, wala mag-digest ng coagulation factors natin, and what you have here would be the clot formation. Okay, based on that, we can classify the different tests here as to the method. So, first one, clot base. So, pag clot base ang test natin, we just take note of the, the time for the clot formation to become your test result. So, we have your ABC divided, that's your APTT kasi, so that's your uh, clot base siya. Then, we have your fibrinogen assay and your lupus anticoagulant profile. Molecular tests, this is the test principle here utilized when you are doing your factor 5 latent mutation for your APC resistance. Another one, we have prothrombin G20-210A. Amino assay in the case of your anticardiolipin antibody. And at, at, at another one, antibodies are anti beta 2 GPI antibody. Those are your amino assay, antigen antibody. Since antibody ito, ang tinitetect natin, then reagents antigen that become an amino assay in the test procedure. Okay, the following test here should be done. If the patient is on anticoagulant therapy, then you need to do the procedure 14 days after the patient has undergone um, anticoagulant therapy to prevent here the, the because it's one, if the patient is on the anticoagulant therapy, it will affect the test results. So, example of the test, we have antithrombin, PS, protein S, protein C, factor 8, and lupus anticoagulant. Again, for the patients undergoing anticoagulant therapy, if you're testing for this one, you need to do that one after 14 days, after they have completed already their anticoagulant therapy. And we have here your antiphospholipid antibody. Antiphospholipid antibody is eventually produced here by patient na my uh, SLE. So this is your anti... Um, uh, these are your lupus anticoagulant actually. So antiphospholipid antibody, so this one since antibody siya, that may be in the form of your IgM, IgG, or IgA na mga antibodies. Okay, the target could be your beta-2 GPI, you could also annexin 5 or prothrombin. 
Then we have your APC activated pa protein C resistance or your APC resistant. You call this one your factor 5 latent mutation. It's a type mutation where in your factor 5 is not or the factor 5 is resistant to your APC. And therefore the APC will not able to digest your factor 5. Because remember your APC protein S, they tend to digest your factor 5, factor 8, para hindi tayo magkakaroon ng clot formation. But in a case where the patient tried to develop here your APC resistant, the factor 5 uh, is resistant to your APC, and therefore it could not be digested. The resistance here because of the mutation occurring in your factor 5, in which what you have here is a replacement of your uh, glutamine is being replaced by the arginine at position number 506. I mean, glutamine replaces glutamine replaces the arginine at 506. So, ang um, normal dapat na amino acid na at 506 dapat is your arginine. However, your arginine has been replaced by your glutamine. And that results to your mutation. What you have here is that your APC or your factor 5 is not uh, or the factor 5 is resistant to your ABC, and therefore it could not be digested. Another one, we have your prothrombin G20-210A is another mutation wherein your adenine replaces your glycine at position. Okay, the, adenine, the adenine here replaces your glycine at position 20,210. That would render your prothrombin to be untranslated. So, this is in your prothrombin. Okay, nagkakaroon ng mutation sa prothrombin na structure na in which your adenine replaces your uh, glycine at position 2010 that would render your prothrombin to be untranslated. And therefore, what you have is increase ang ating prothrombin. So, pang madami kang prothrombin, that would result to your thrombus or clot formation. So we have also here antithrombin. So this is your formerly known as antithrombin 3. So they try to act on preventing your uh, or try to inhibit your thrombin that will eventually convert your fibrinogen to your fibrin clot. So it helps para hindi tayo magkakaroon na thrombosis. So by inhibiting your factor 2, which is your thrombin, factor 9, factor 10, and factor 11. So, your antithrombin here could be enhanced by your anticoagulant, like for example, your mga heparin formulation natin, like your uh, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and then your fondaparin oxodrum. Plus, we have also your DTI, direct thrombin inhibitor, would also help here the activity with your antithrombin. Direct thrombin inhibitor, like for example, your argatroban, bivalirudin, dabigatan. So, deficiency of your antithrombin results to your thrombus formation. So, we have two types of your deficiency acquired related to some existing medical condition like your liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, prolonged heparin therapy, or congenital. That might be type 1, quantitative, so that's decrease ang kanyang concentration. Type 2 is more qualitative, you have normal concentration but it's not functioning. So, therefore, it will not be able to inhibit your thrombin. So, nagkakaroon pa rin tayo ng cleft formation. Then, we have your another na antibody na kalimutan ko. This is your another antiposphalipid antibody, which is your antiposphatidylserin. This is more specific to diagnose someone na may uh, lupus anticoagulant in a patient of a SLE. Even if your result of your anticoagulipid antibody, your uh, LA, your lupus anticoagulant profile, or even your anti-beta-2 GPI antibody are all negative. But still, you're suspecting for the patient, so I perform this test. Kung mag-positive siya dito, then still, we consider this patient to be uh, thrombotic pa din patient natin, or my thrombosis. Okay, the normal values natin for the IgM, since it's an antibody, is less than uh, 22, and for the IgG, less than 16 units. So, pag ang result may more than to this normal reference, then we consider someone to have thrombosis. Okay, then we have also here the protein S. Again, the protein S is the cofactor of the protein C. In order for you to produce here your ABC protein S complex, which tend to digest your factor 5, factor 8. Okay, so your protein S produced by the liver, 40% of that is free, 60% of that is bound, bound to your C4B binding protein. Okay, we have your deficiency in your protein S. Protein C could be heterozygous or homozygous. 
Heterozygous here would put the patient at risk for 1.6 to 11.5 times for pulmonary embolism, and we have also here your recurrent deep vein thrombosis. Homozygous, on the other hand, would have as a to your neonatal purpura fulminance in which the patient would have a thrombotic tendency. So we have here different types of the protein S deficiency. We have your qualitative, quantitative, and the inflammatory related to your inflammatory conditions. So they are deficiency, therefore, their activity is less than 65%, and we consider this one as decrease. Another parameter here, we have your free protein S, and we have total antigen, and we have also your C4B binding protein, which is the bound form. For the quantitative, since number ang problem dito lahat ay mababa, less than lahat sa so 65%, ang C4B binding protein niya ay normal. Qualitative, the problem with qualitative is not on the concentration, but rather on the function. But still, since deficiency ito, problem pa rin siya, so less than 65% here. But in terms of the number, as to the free protein S, and even your total, they are more than 65%. So, meaning to say, hindi sila, hindi dito ang problem natin, but on the function. Uh, the bound form, say for B-bound protein, we have your normal, and related to your inflammatory conditions, less than 65% protein S activity niya, they find that one would be deficiency or problem. The antigen, the free protein S is less than 65%, but the total antigen is more than 65%. And this is also characterized by an increase in your bound form, the C4B binding protein form. For the next one, we have here your arterial thrombosis. Arterial thrombosis would be the problem with your artery or there's a blood formation within our artery. We have here the predisposing factors that would eventually result to your arterial thrombosis. We have your total cholesterol. We have also here your increased total cholesterol, uh, increased na bad cholesterol, your LDL, and in decrease ang ating uh, good cholesterol, decreased level ng ating HDL. And also the ratio of your total cholesterol with HDL is also increased. So we have the specific na markers for us to diagnose someone na my arterial thrombosis. Okay, the first one, we have your high-density CRP. So, CRP always acute phase reactant ito. A normal voice of that, 0.3 to 1.7 mg per liter. Uh, that one is your mg per liter, milligram per liter. Good thing about your CRP, this one is uh, for inflammatory conditions. The result here is stable and reproducible. Fibrinogen is called also be utilized here as a marker for your uh, arterial thrombosis. Again, the normal voice for that is 220 to 498 mg per dl. But the problem with that is hindi siya ganun ka reproducible ang result natin. Homocysteine is 4.6 to 11.1 micromole per liter. But the value of your homocysteine is affected by the level of your vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and your folic acid. Total cholesterol less than 200 mg per dl. Ratio of Total cholesterol HDL should be less than 10. And the value of your bad cholesterol, low density lipoprotein, should be less than 130 mg per dl. Again, these are the normal reference. So, pag ang result natin ay ganito, so you are normal. Pero pag ang result mo ay mataas dito, then we consider you as someone na may arterial thrombosis. Okay, then we have here your CRP. Again, the CRP is acute phase reactant, primarily produced by the liver. This is a calcium-dependent na substance. And basically, this one is used here to predict for the cardiovascular disease. A risk factor here, regardless of your lipid profile na result. So, independent siya. It can stand alone here for you to predict here your cardiovascular disease. Another one, we have your plasma homocysteine. This is a sulfur-containing amino acid. The level of this one is highly correlated or being affected by the level of your vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and your folic acid. We have here the relative risk factor here, 1.7, na ratio here that would be associated with your uh, coronary artery disease. 2.5 is cardiovascular disease. 6.8, we have your peripheral arterial disease. Another parameter that could also be used here for the diagnosis of your thrombosis, arterial thrombosis, we have here your fibrinogen. Okay, fibrinogen could be measured by several methods like your immunoassay, nephilometry, and Klaus 
based clat based na method okay the level of fibrinogen try to correlate with the degree of your coronary heart disease in patient with the myocardial infarction or angina pectoris so if the level of your fibrinogen is increased most likely that would have also increased risk for your coronary heart disease and even increased cholesterol level but if the value of your fibrinogen is decreased automatic yan na you'd have here a decreased chance of developing coronary heart disease even if your cholesterol level is mataas. And the last one, we have your lipoprotein A. This is an abnormal lipoprotein variant. So this normal value for this 2.2 to 49.8, 49.4 uh, milligrams per DL. So your lipoprotein A could be measured by enzyme immunoassay this one would have an anti-fibrinolytic activity which eventually prevent the lysis of your fibrin clot because it tend to compete with your plasminogen for the binding site with your newly produced na fibrin clot. So remember that pag na-digest na ng clot, kailangan natin ng plasmin, di ba? But your plasmin, for that to become plasmin, plasminogen muna siya. Plasminogen maging plasmin and if you have already plasmin, that's the only time we're going to digest the clot. Para mag-dissolve ang clot natin, para wala tayong thrombos formation. Ito sa LPA, ang ginagawa niya ay, you try to compete with your plasminogen to your fibrin clot. Pag naunahan niyo na, plasminogen will not bind, and therefore it will not be activated, converting to your plasmin, and therefore ang clot natin ay hindi madadigest. And therefore what you have here still remain ang clot sa ating arteries and that results here to your thrombosis. And therefore, the presence of your high level ng LPA would have a greater chance of developing your arterial thrombosis. Okay, thank you.